Hello, my name is Thomas. Welcome to this edition of British Culture, Albion Never Dies. This episode is G is for great. But before I go into that, I thought I'd better say I'd asked in the previous episode, where is the best fish and chips? And I'd asked a range of people that in the podcast and in a few different places, including the Facebook group Britain, people, places and pastimes. And I got an overwhelming response. Most people saying, my hometown, wherever my hometown is, is the best, but the majority of respondents were from the north. So, for example, the Codfather in Barnsley, which I'm I'm happy to see it represented there. (laughs) Thanks for a great name for a chippy as well. The Plough Chippy in Huddersfield Road, Oldham, and a few people from the south coast, but mostly it was from the north, and from the north it was mostly Yorkshire. So, uh, well done, Yorkshire. (laughs) You definitely have the best fish and chips. I called it... Um, those are the people who responded. Again, thank you so much. I mentioned that Facebook group, Britain, People, Places and Pastimes. I asked there, in the alphabet of Britishness, what does G stand for? And I got more than 130 responses. So thank you very much to everybody there. I'm just going to use first names when referring to people from that group um, because unlike, say, some people on Instagram really want to be found, uh, I think a lot of people on Facebook kind of share it as their personal social network. So I hope I'm not being overly familiar just using your first names. But I'll just read out, who said great? Well, first of all, uh, Chinza, Joyce, Linda, Trevor, Tim, James, who included a picture of Tony the Tiger, saying great. Shirley, Jacqueline, Mary, Elizabeth, Marilyn, Susan, Sandra, Mark, Bruce, Eileen, Chris, Vijay Parla, Nikki, and Pamela. <laughs> that's quite a list. I think that's more votes for great than I've ever had for any other topic. So, why do we describe our own country? As Great Britain, we we don't refer to fantastic France, or gorgeous Germany, or spanking Spain. (laughs) We generally don't include adjectives in other countries' names. But this doesn't necessarily come from us. Okay, so the earliest known name for Great Britain is, in fact, Albion. The name of this podcast is Albion Never Dies, and I really use that to try and kind of talk about British culture without kind of trying to restrict it by any politically used term. Albion is really a poetical term. It's kind of the ideal of Britishness, which includes, you know, England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. I really wanted to include the whole of the British Isles, just in its geographic meaning, because what is England without Ireland? The two countries are very much linked. Um, If only in myself and my own family history and a few others like me. Anyway, before I go into my family history, let's go to the what is Great Britain. Okay, so Albion, which comes from uh, the Latin, perhaps meaning white, as in the White Cliffs of Dover, um, which is the first view most people, you know, from the continent coming to Britain have, the beautiful, beautiful white cliffs. Um, The oldest mention of terms related to Great Britain was actually by Aristotle in 384, maybe to 322 BC, Um, and he referred to two very large islands called the British Isles, Albion and Ierne. Um, My my ancient Greek pronunciation isn't great, (laughs) Um, but he referred to it as these two very large islands. And of course there's a collection, there's more than two. I mean, aside from you know, the island on which England, Scotland and Wales are found, and aside from the island of Ireland, there's also the Isle of Man, Guernsey, Jersey, um, the Isle of Wight, um, the, the, uh, the Shetland Islands, the Orkney Islands. In fact, Scotland has around seven to 800 islands, depending on what you classify as an island and what you classify as a rock out in the sea. So this is a very <laughs> geographically complex uh, part of uh, Northwest Europe. So when we refer to Great Britain, in its simplest sense, we're simply referring to the biggest island out of all of them. Of course, we may be patting ourselves on the back, giving ourselves a compliment, and I believe the, the government of Ireland doesn't really recognise this term of Great Britain, again for political reasons, but individual ministers will use the term, again, it's, it's in our common language. Of course, in uh, if you look in other languages, you know, in Chinese we talk about Yingguo, which uh, literally means brave land, although, again, it's mainly just because it sounds like England, and they use that to refer to the whole of the United Kingdom. 
Equally, in Turkish, we say Inglaterra. Uh, you can refer to Birleşik Kralık, which is the United Kingdom, but generally people say Inglaterra, and they might just say London <laughs> to represent the whole of the country. Um, so again, in our own language, we are very, very complex and specific. You know, the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, the British Isles, including those, and the Isle of Man, Guernsey, and Jersey. Um, and then the British Isles, kind of, again, in a purely geographic sense, then referring to the whole collection. But of course, great is also an adjective, uh, meaning, you know, fantastic, wonderful. <laughs> and naturally, we think we are. But I do find it interesting, again, if we go back into the deep roots of the language. Britain descends from a Latin name for Britain, Britannia, the land of the Britons. And of course, there are Bretons in northern France who were thought to be very related. So I believe it's in uh, Julius Caesar's writings that he refers to the Britons as kind of Britons, a type of Gaul, and he encounters them, he thinks, first in the war against the Gauls. Uh, so they're seen as very, very linked together. So in that sense, you know, the word Brittany and Britain are very much related. So, as I say, a huge number of people were saying great uh, for Great Britain. But if the term is contentious sometimes in its kind of political use, um, what are some alternatives? Again, in classical geography, you could refer to our island as Oceani Insulae. So in classical geography, the Mediterranean world, um, Mediterranean, the middle land and then the sea around it, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, it was thought to be surrounded by a fast-flowing river referred to as Titan Oceanus. Um, so that's kind of, it was thought to be a fast-flowing river circulating around Europe and cutting it off from everything else in the world. So as Oceani Insulae, we were the islands of the ocean. Uh, and in some ancient writings, uh, various islands, including what we now call Britain, Ireland, and somewhere called Thule, which we, we think might be Norway, uh, were referred to as Septem Trionalis Oceani Insulae, the islands of the northern ocean. Um, that was referred to by one of the earliest Roman geographers, uh, Pomponius Mela. Struggling with the Latin name there. <laughs> but again, we get have some alternative names. Um, it has been referred to perhaps as the islands of the North Atlantic, uh, Iona. But again, that was seen as a bit contentious because it doesn't include all the islands of the North Atlantic. So again, generally, Great Britain is what we've gone with as the name for ourselves. Now, when I've been going through the alphabet of Britishness, some letters have been really, really hard. But some letters <laughs> have been quite easy, and I've received a lot of suggestions from a lot of people. G was one I received a huge number of suggestions. So whilst G is for great, and that was overwhelmingly the most popular one, G was also suggested as being for gentlemen. Um, and I'd really like to mention here Chris Morales, who is known on Instagram as that one Bond guy. I interviewed him uh, some time ago now, but it's still one of my most popular podcasts, which was uh, Britishness as Viewed from California. Um, so he is a, a self-confessed Anglophile. He loves watching British TV shows. Uh, he wants to visit Britain more and more. Um, and, and he said that one thing that really grabs him is this idea of a gentleman. And again, from the Facebook group, uh, there were two ladies who suggested gentleman uh, as, as the G in the alphabet of Britishness. And it's an, interesting, it's an interesting one, right? So the dictionary definition, you know, is a chivalrous, courteous, honourable man. He behaved like a perfect gentleman, as an example. Or just a polite way of referring to a man opposite her, an old gentleman sat reading. Um, and of course, the address, you know, ladies and gents. So originally... It was the lowest rank of the landed gentry, you know, ranking below an esquire and above a yeoman. So back in that very formalised feudal era. Um, but it was often um, questioned. It was questioned as a term, and often we go back to the 19th century for the big social reforms, but here we can even go back to the Peasants' Revolt in 1381, where they were questioning, really, who is the gentleman here, really implying, um, you know, codes of behaviour. Um, in the tale of Mellyby, Geoffrey Chaucer, I, I struggle with his writing, uh, he's, he's a fantastic author but terrible spelling, um, certs he should not be called a gentleman that knee doth his diligence and busyness to keep his good name. So he's really tying together uh, 
Again, even 1386, around about the time he's writing this, he's really suggesting that it's the behaviour that makes a gentleman rather than, you know, the birth, the rank, the, the feudal system. So again, it's kind of, it's already doubtful, right, in the medieval era. And by the 19th century, again, the term really widens out. Um, I saw an interesting article on how the Encyclopedia Britannica defined the word gentleman. So in 1815, a gentleman is one who without any title bears a coat of arms or whose ancestors have been free men. By the seventh edition in 1845, then it's all rank above yeoman. Um, then in the eighth edition in 1856, then it really kind of refers to a limited sense, giving the previous definitions, that says that it's a courtesy, it's a title um, given to those all above common tradesmen when their manners are indicative of a certain amount of refinement and intelligence. Um, maybe you watch the, the fantastic TV show in the 90s, Sharp, uh, in which the common man is able to become an officer and rise up through the ranks in the Napoleonic Wars. And one of the cutting remarks from Julian Fellows, um, the actor who will later write uh, Downton Abbey, is where he kind of he cuts at, at Sharp and said, you know, an officer must always behave like a gentleman, even if he is not a gentleman. <laughs> really playing with the two definitions of it. Uh, but again, the Great Reform Act, 1832, it did its work. Um, when you get the middle classes coming into their own, and gentlemen kind of starts to refer to the distinction of blood less and less, and more to a distinction of position, education, and manners. So it's interesting that that term had already been played with way back at the time of the Peasants' Revolt, but this is the time we start to see it more and more as it's how you behave. There is... I'm surprised. It's a relatively recent usage of gentleman. It's a prefix to another term to apply that a man has sufficient wealth and free time to pursue an area of interest without depending upon it. Um, so, for example, gentleman scientist, gentleman farmer, uh, gentleman pirate, gentleman podcaster, <laughs> where it implies that you have sufficient wealth to do nothing except pursue your pursue your loves and pursue your hobbies. So that is a, that is a definite use of it. Um, until 1962 in cricket, a man playing the game was a gentleman cricketer if you didn't get a salary for taking part in the game. Otherwise, you were a player. And that's, that's used in a variety of sports. Uh, for example, an amateur jockey is called a gentleman rider uh, in some flat and hurdle races. But for the most part, it really refers to your conduct. Um, I lived in China for six years, and if I mentioned that I was English, they'd often say the one English word that they all know, which is gentleman. Um, they probably know hello, <laughs> and they might know okay, uh, but gentleman is it's surprising how widespread this word has become. Uh, they won't use a Chinese term, they'll specifically use the English word gentleman, and of course it's been used in uh, Korean pop music as well. So it is something that seems to have this global reach, uh, the idea of a man you know, being judged on his, his manners, his etiquette and so on, uh, rather than wealth or position at birth. So it is an interesting one. Um, so thank you to, to Chris Morales and the two ladies in the Facebook group who suggested it. I'm going to go at a pace now because there were so many suggestions and they're all so good. This next one is from a friend of the podcast, Kid Bodden fan on Instagram. He's a... Uh, He's a good kid. <laughs> Check him out on Instagram. He suggested Gromit, as in Wallace and Gromit, the stop-motion animated inventor and his dog. Gromit is the dog. Um, I did see a vote online. Which would you rather have, a mug with a likeness of Gromit on it or world peace? And overwhelmingly, people voted for the mug. <laughs> Gromit is a wonderful creation. Um, who never speaks, but is very, very, very expressive as his inventor, owner, gets up to all kinds of different mishaps. Starting in 1989 with a grand day out, and then I remember the wrong trousers coming out, 1983, a close shave, 1995, and then the feature film, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit, <laughs> in 2005. I, I've seen all, th all of them multiple, multiple times. I really, really like them, including A Matter of Loaf and Bread. Um, 
So yeah, the, the film, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit, is the second highest grossing stop motion animated film of all time. And has only been beaten by Chicken Run, <laughs> made by the same man, Nick Park. Um, and I find this fascinating. Uh, a Grand Day Out was nominated for an Academy Award. It nearly got the Oscar in 1991, but it lost to Creature Comforts, which was also made by Nick Park. He is a, he's a one-man industry in terms of creating this. And they are fantastic ambassadors uh, for Britain and around the world. Um, I love how it's kind of taken almost specifically Yorkshire culture and made it well known to almost, I don't know, everyone all over the world. I mean, in Japan, I've seen plenty of Wallace and Gromit <laughs> toys on sale. Um, I've heard about Wallace and Gromit being used in English teaching, so people actually learn the English language through Wallace and Gromit. Um, there is a curriculum on this. It's a fantastic representation of Britain, and uh, as I say, I, I, I love... I love all of these. Thank you very much, Kid Bond fan, for giving me an excuse to dive into this and have a look. But I better quickly uh, get into St. George. G is for George. Makes sense. And that's uh, from Karen in the Facebook group. George is an interesting one. St. George is the patron saint of England, but he is also the patron saint of so many places around the world um, and it always gets the question so who is this saint what is the historical record um, as sadly with many of the early Christian saints our only certain date is when he died uh, the 23rd of April the year 303 uh, his, his father uh, was of Greek origin uh, Gerontius he was a Cappadocian serving in the Roman army his mother uh, Polly Corona was a Christian from the city of Lod in Palestine. Uh, so St. George himself then became uh, a Cappadocian uh, soldier. Um, he was in the Praetorian Guard. Sorry, he was in the Praetorian Guard for the Roman Emperor Diocletian, and he was sentenced to death for refusing to recant his Christian faith. Um, so he's one of the most venerated saints, and in Christianity, he's called a, a, megalo, a megalomartyr. So a megalomartyr, this comes from the, from the Greek megas and martyrs. So megas meaning great and martyr being, well, martyr. That's where I get the word. Sorry, martyrs being martyr. Uh, so it's a specific classification of saints who are venerated in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, so generally speaking, it's someone who's undergone excruciating torture, often performing miracles, converting unbelievers to Christianity, and someone who's attained widespread veneration throughout the Church, normally from the first centuries of the church before the edict of milan so again saint george was a christian before the edict of milan if you're wondering what is the edict of milan great that's the next thing um the edict of milan uh, was the february ad uh, 313 agreement to treat christians benevolently within the roman empire so saint george was martyred in the year 303 Ten years later, 313, we have the agreement to treat Christians benevolently. And that was an agreement between Constantine, who I think is famous as the Christian emperor, and uh, Licinius, who controlled the Balkans. They met in what is now Milan, and among other things, agreed to change their policies towards Christians. This was not the one that made uh, Christianity the state church. Uh, that happened in 308. 80, the Edict of Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki, depending <laughs> on which time frame's name for the city you're using. Uh, but St. George, he's a soldier, uh, he's a very early saint, and quite prominent. Um, so naturally, you do have him as a patron saint of England, Ethiopia, Georgia, Catalonia, Aragon and Spain, Moscow in Russia, and several other saints. Um, there's, there's a quite a variety of regions, cities, universities, professions and organisations uh, claiming Gre uh, George as their patron. Now, this is, uh, I don't know, I, I, this is kind of maybe an interesting tangent, but he is uh, described as a prophetic figure in Islamic sources as well. He's venerated by some Christians and Muslims uh, because of kind of a, a composite personality. It combines several biblical, Quranic and other ancient mythical heroes. So in some sources he's identified with Elisha and others as al qadir uh, meaning the verdant one or a slave of God. So al qadir is Arabic, uh, but it sounds to me a bit like Kul, which is the Turkish for a slave to God, which again, a tangent on a tangent, but uh, if Kul means uh, means a slave to God. Then we have uh, the Turkish tag, Hatasas Kulolmaz, 
which means nobody's no slave of God is perfect, or just nobody's perfect. Uh, but we also then have Hatasa's Kul cool Maz, Dickens's Gul cool Maz, uh, which is nobody's perfect, every rose has its thorn, <laughs> which I particularly enjoy. Uh, there is a shrine to the prophet George in Diyarbakir, uh, which is in the south east of Turkey. Um, and it's been referred to um, in Turkish kind of historical writing by Evliya Çelebi. Çelebi, uh, funnily enough, means gentleman, connecting to our earlier topic. And it's a pretty common surname now, but at the time it was a title. And he referred to it in his uh, Sehatname, which is a, a travelogue, that he visited the tombs of the prophet Jonah and the prophet George in the city. It's a wonderful thing to travel around and see these things. I haven't seen that one, but I saw... Oh, I went to... Job's tomb, uh, which is in Oman, uh, and it's a beautiful, beautiful place um, up in the up in the hills. Not quite the mountains yet, um, but it's a beautiful place with a mosque, and there's a stone with a, a deep um, dip in it, and it's referred to as as Job's footprint. Um, anyway, Saint, Saint George is a, a fascinating character, but why is he the patron saint of England? Well, especially because he's a military saint, um, and he. England took part in the Crusades, so there's an association with uh, Richard Coeur de Lyon, or Richard the Lionhearted, and in 1348, Edward III. Edward III is a really interesting king, and I talked about him a lot in Deers for Democracy, but Edward III created the Order of the Garter and chose George as the patron saint of the Order of the Garter, and he also took to using the red on white cross uh, in the hoist of his royal standard. Uh, so that gives us a very clear connection between George and the English monarchy. Um, going back further into history, uh, George's cross might not be red on white. It's simply the cross that extends all the way to the borders of the flag, so in which case you might say there's quite a lot of St. George's flags out there, but you know, of course in the modern definition it's the red on white, like England, and funnily enough, like the country Georgia, which also claims St. George. Something that no other nation is claiming, G is for gun carriage competition. Thank you very much to Bree Tyke, uh, one of the admins in the uh, the Facebook group. I saw the gun catch competition uh, when I was young, and it has stayed in my mind ever since as a truly, truly impressive feat. It is the Royal Navy's field gun competition, so it's a contest between teams from a range of Royal Navy commands in which sailors compete to transport a field gun and its equipment over and through a series of obstacles in the shortest time. I remember watching this in a stadium and it was truly, truly electric. Um, it harks back to the relief of Ladysmith in 1900 by Royal Navy gunners drawing the Boer War and essentially they reenacted with all of the obstacles that they faced. Um, it's a phenomenal test of agility, speed, strength and teamwork. Um, sadly, uh, this used to be the, the climax of the Royal Tournament. Uh, sadly, this doesn't run anymore. Um, so in 1992, the services decided they could no longer free the 2,500 personnel needed to run this show for its traditional three weeks. They cut it to a fortnight, and that gradually stripped it of its kind of financial viability. So it's gradually uh, just faded away. Um, you can see it on YouTube, uh, I must stress. Look at the ones from the 1980s, because <laughs> that was the best quality footage uh, before uh, the field gun competition started to be kind of changed and altered, and to be honest, I'm going to say degraded. I think it's a phenomenal thing, and I'm very lucky I was able to see it when it was, the, the, the great sight it was. Maybe one day they'll bring it back. I, I hope so, because it really was, I say, something that made a very great impression on me at a, at a young age. Um, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal display. Uh, of what sailors can do. Okay, I mentioned there were a lot of topics, and there are. Um, Kane, my friend in Fujo, I've, I've had him on the podcast quite a lot for a number of deep dives, as he's a, what can I say, a well-educated, well-read, great fella and friend. And he suggested, very simply, G is for Gladstone. And I really, really like this. So he's a... He's a liberal politician, William Oart Gladstone. He had a career lasting over seven, uh, sorry, 60 years. I'm promoting him 70. 
60 years. He served for 12 years as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, spread over four terms beginning in 1868, ending in 1894. And he also served as Chancellor of the Exchequer for times, serving over 12 years. That's the head of Britain's finances. He was an incredible man. And what's incredible about him, and I, I'm trying to pull out different aspects from his life in isolation. One of them was the Midlothian campaign in the general election of 1880, in which a lot of people would argue was the first truly modern election. Okay, so it's not... What was new was not that he spoke from a kind of from a platform to a large number of people, although he was able to reach an astonishing number of people in the electorate, an astonishing proportion of the electorate actually saw him speak. But what was really new, what was really, really unusual, is the fact that the campaign was designed as a media event. Specific attention was paid to the deadlines and operational requirements of journalists covering it, so that he would make the morning papers, the evening papers, with maximum impact and the whole of the election was really crafted around that by his team uh, of course this seems normal now it seems natural but it was something that didn't exist beforehand he did it and now everyone does it um, so it's a phenomenal phenomenal operational um, change um, there's a book called original spin downing street and the press in victorian britain and it, it argues really the transformative nature of gladstone's campaign so if he was a great campaign, what did he campaign for? Uh, let's look at three issues. Uh, obviously, a lot of listeners are from the United States, about a third, so let's talk about the U.S. Um, two other great issues of his time were slavery and Ireland. So let's start with the U.S. He was asked uh, about his view on the Civil War at the time, uh, and he said, this is a quote, The principle announced by the Vice President of the South which asserts the superiority of the white man, and therewith founds on its right to hold the black in slavery, I think that principle is detestable, and I am wholly with the opponents of it. End of quote. But he also believed that the North was wrong to try and restore the Union by military force. So he was uh, keen for Britain to be neutral in the war, although he had very strong beliefs about the two sides. For slavery, as an older man, he looked back and said the abolition of slavery was one of the greatest achievements of his lifetime. He was not a leader in abolition. I've read that his father was a slave owner and that it has affected his view of it. He believed in gradual emancipation rather than dramatic. But as an older man, he'd look back and say this is one one thing on which the masses who believed in abolition were absolutely right and the aristocracy who believed in gradualism were absolutely wrong. I find that very interesting, that he was a man who could look back on his own career and cite his own mistakes. Most, most biographies that I look at will rarely focus on his view on Ireland. His view on Ireland is complex. Uh, so in 1881, uh, he established the Irish Coercion Act, and that permitted the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland to detain people for, quote, as long as was thought necessary. Uh, this was after the assassination of the Irish Secretary um, by Irish rebels in Dublin. But he also gave Irish tenants the three Fs, fair rent, fixity of tenure, and free sale. And during his third premiership, he first introduced the Home Rule Bill for Ireland, the idea of giving Ireland its own parliament. Um, this was an issue that split his own party through the middle. In fact, one part of his own party broke away and, and founded a rival party. The bill was thrown out, um, ending his government after a few months. But he was seen from this to be a very, very principled believer in Home Rule, in greater independence for Ireland. One of his great downfalls, again, he was Prime Minister four times, one of his great downfalls came from Africa. Um, there was a general, General Gordon, who was often known as Chinese Gordon, um, due to his role in the Taipang Rebellion and putting down the Taipang Rebellion. Um, he was sent uh, to relieve forces in what is now Sudan. Uh, he was sent there to withdraw forces. He went and held it um, from what was known at the time as the Mad Mahdi, an, an early Islamic militant. Um, 
His force was under siege in Khartoum for ten months, and Gladstone came under increasing pressure to send a relief force, and he really tried to withhold this pressure. He didn't want Britain to expand into the Sudan. Eventually, he caved to pressure, and in January 1885, the relief column arrived two days after a massacre, which killed thousands, uh, mainly Brits, Egyptians, and local troops. Um, the disaster proved a major blow to Gladstone's popularity. Queen Victoria sent him a telegram of rebuke, which found its way into the press. So this caused one of his great downfalls at the end of his second term. He would later recover. He would be Prime Minister twice, and I think that's an interesting insight into Victorian Britain, that the monarch could be known to publicly um, rebuke the Prime Minister. He would lose office, but could still come back. I think I'll end. Most you know, politicians aren't remembered for their foreign policy. Most people don't vote on foreign policy. Most people vote on domestic policy. And I think it gives a, a big insight into him to look at what he wrote in 1891. It was reported in the Times. He said, regarding the, the Britain he saw at the time, It is a lamentable fact if, in the midst of our civilization, and at the close of the 19th century, the workhouse is all that can be offered to the industrious labourer at the end of a long and honourable life. I do not enter the, into the question now in detail. I do not say it's an easy one. I do not say it will be solved in a moment, but I do say this. That until society is able to offer to the industrious labourer at the end of a long and blameless life something better than the workhouse, society will not have discharged its duties to its poorer members. His focus on unions the right to what we now call collective bargaining, his view on Ireland, really gives shape to who he was. And I'm very pleased I was able to talk about him, and I didn't mention, so far, the other fella. <laughs> Quite often, Gladstone is not talked about just by himself as what an interesting man he was. Normally you have books such as 2013's The Great Rivalry, Gladstone and Israeli. Or 2007's The Lion and the Unicorn, Gladstone and Israeli. Or Gladstone and Israeli, a reappraisal of their relationship. Generally the two men are written about together, their names are said almost in the same breath. I've read that really they got along very, very well. Uh, they were rivals at the end of their career, they'd worked together um, in the middle of their career and had very little to do with each other early on. Um, but they didn't personally feel any kind of antipathy towards each other. Um, but it was, they were both the great magnets uh, of the era. People gravitated towards the two of them, and they ended up being kind of the two poles of Victorian Britain. Uh, but the two of them were said to get along very, very well. But I'm glad that I was able to speak for so long about Gladstone, and not the other fella, because he does deserve his own light. As does really does too, by the way. But we moved on from D. Okay. Normally, I'd be drawing the podcast to an end about this time, but there is a fella who rarely deserves to be talked about. Thank you very much to Ian, um, who's a friend of mine, a personal friend in uh, Shenzhen. He said, G must be for Guy Fawkes. I agree. Absolutely. This is the gunpowder plot of 1605, Remember, Remember. Who was Guy Fawkes? Well, he was born, educated in York. His father died when he was eight years old after which his mother married a recusant Catholic, um, somebody who'd been banned from going to the Catholic Church in those, in those very turbulent, turbulent years. Um, his cousin uh, became a Jesuit priest, so his family was very, very Catholic-orientated, which is not a minor thing in his life. In fact, it would become the dominant aspect of his life. Um, so in uh, 1591, Fork sold his family estate, uh, that he'd inherited and travelled to the continent of Europe to fight in the Eighty Years' War. So this was for Catholic Spain against the new, then new Dutch Republic. Um, so he fought there from 1595 uh, until the Peace of Vervins in 1598. Now England was not then engaged in land operations against Spain, but the two countries were still at war, and the Spanish Armada 1588 was only five years in the past. He chose a side. Physically, um, Antonio de Fraser, uh, the very, very renowned uh, British historian, 
uh, wrote about him in uh, 1996, the gunpowder plot. She described him as tall, powerfully built, with thick reddish-brown hair and, and flowing moustache in the tradition of the time, and bushy reddish-brown beard. Um, she described him as a man of action, but also capable of intelligent arguments, um, somewhat to the surprise of his enemies. They might see him as a man of brawn, not of brain. He was of both. I find it interesting that he had reddish-brown hair. I've often seen him in pictures with, uh, with jet-black hair. So he travelled, um, Guy Fawkes travelled to Spain to seek the support of a Catholic rebellion in England without success, but he would later meet Thomas Wintour. And Wintour introduced him to Robert Catsby, who planned to assassinate King James I of England or Sixth of Scotland. So that was the gunpowder plot of 1605. You probably know the story that they were putting um, gunpowder into the basement of the House of Commons and planned, well, maybe... Maybe the poem can speak for itself. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Gunpowder, treason and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Now there's various versions after this, but I'll, I'll stick to this one which seems to be the dominant. Guy Fawkes, Guy Fawkes, twas his intent to blow up the king and the parliament. Three score barrels of powder below, poor old England to overthrow. By God's provenance he was catched with dark lantern and burning match. Holler boys, holler boys, let the bell ring. So this is really about a Catholic attempt to take over England and rob it of its public assembly, Parliament. It is funny how the, uh, the face of Guy Fawkes has been turned into a mask for kind of all kinds of anarchy. Guy Fawkes did not believe in anarchy. Um, and and it, is, it, is, it is funny. Um, then, of course, history is full of symbols being taken from one purpose and used for another purpose. Uh, but Guy Fawkes is a really interesting one, a man who believed in overthrowing kind of a popular parliament and instituting Catholic reign has become the face of anarchist movements. History is strange. Okay, a very short topic. A gentleman on Instagram called Bond Up North, a Yorkshireman, messaged me and said, F, sorry, G, Oh, it's for fat rascals. I think we missed that one. Oh, no, sorry, I skipped over that before. But I have to say, I can't not include it. Fat rascals are fantastic. They're, Americans describe them as a type of cookie. Um, Google them, you'll see. Okay. The next one is also kind of a, a hit and miss one in a sense. D was missed for Doctor Who, but that's okay. Daniel Gaster messaged me. Um, Daniel Gaster is on Instagram with the name Daniel Gaster. Um, and you can find him on uh, from Tailors of Love on the blog. Um, but he suggested G is for Gallifrey. Uh, that is, of course, the name of Doctor Who's home planet. Uh, and Doctor Who is a British science fiction television series produced by the BBC. The original run lasted 26 years, from 1963, same year as From Russia With Love, to 1989. I remember it moved to radio for a long time and then it resumed on television in 2005 to great acclaim. Uh, I remember it was Christopher Eccleston um, who was the star for just one series flying around in his TARDIS which actually has a diction definition I think in the shorter Oxford English Dictionary it is TARDIS means the time and relative dimension in space machine. <laughs> so it allows Doctor Who to travel anywhere in the universe at any time in the universe and of course there's plenty plenty of jokes gosh a man who can travel anywhere in time and space and it's always going to what early millennium whales um or going to a planet that looks like whales i was talking to the husband of a friend here um who was saying that he used to watch the a-team and the a-team was supposed to travel all over the world but it always looked like a certain district of california i've just come to california and gosh, it all looks like somewhere from the A team. I think it looks fantastic. So I wonder if you're an American fan of uh, Doctor Who and you watch the really old Doctor Who's, which is all kind of a quarry here in Wales or something, whether that all looks really exotic and when you go to England, gosh, this all looks like Doctor Who. <laughs> of course, the modern, the modern ones use all kinds of special effects. The TV show is listed in the Guinness World Records as the longest running science fiction television show in the world. And of course, had its fantastic theme tune, um, which was originally composed by Ron Grainer, but then it was arranged by Delia Derbyshire, um, who's referred to as uh, the unsung 
Delia Derbyshire in every article I've ever read about her. Um, and there's a lot of articles on her that refer to her as unsung because she really helped develop electronic music in the UK with this Doctor Who theme tune. Um, so it first aired in 1963, uh, just by comparison, Star Trek um, first aired in 1966 uh, in Canada, uh, and then it aired, I think, just a couple of days later in the United States. Um, so it is a very, very long-running science fiction show. Okay, Mr. Easy Smiles and Expensive Watchers, who dominated the last podcast with his suggestion, um, suggested again a few different ones, Gilgood, as in the British actor John Gilgood, who was a very, very well thought of actor. Uh, early in his career, he really only wanted to do theatre. Later in his life, he agreed to do uh, movies and took them more and more seriously as he got older and older. Um, he was so focused on acting and his art um, and so indifferent to politics that he was once at a formal dinner uh, not long after the Second World War and he, he talked to a fellow guest and said, uh, whereabouts are you living now? <laughs> Unaware that the man he was talking to was Clement Attlee, whose answer was 10 Downing Street. I'm the Prime Minister now. <laughs> A very interesting suggestion, again from Easy Smiles and Expensive Watches, was the George Cross. So this is the highest award bestowed by the British government for non-operational gallantry, or gallantry not in the presence of the enemy. Um, so in the UK honour system, the George Cross is equal to the Victoria Cross, which is the highest military gallantry award um, since the introduction of the award in 1940. Of course, that date is important because that's the date of the Blitz, the German bombing campaign, or say the London docks, and all major UK cities um, in which it was more dangerous uh, to be living in London than it was to be a soldier on the front lines. Um, in terms of death rates, it was a shocker. Um, look up the night of the great Wa- the night of the great raid, and you can see some some harrowing statistics and pictures if you want them. Um, but of course, there were people whose actions were astonishingly courageous, firemen and just ordinary citizens helping out in the er- the era of total war. Um, and so the recognition that this was a war in which civilians were in the front line uh, was recognised with a George Cross. Um, it was incorporated into the flag of Malta, this small Mediterranean island held out against um, German blockades, German bombing, immense German pros- pressure for it to give in, uh, and it did not give in. And it was so well thought of, it, as I say, the George Cross was awarded to the whole island. It was incorporated into the flag in 1943, and since independence in um, 1964, it's been on the flag. Um, so that's why there's a medal on the flag of Malta. It has also been given to the RUC, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, and uh, very recently to Britain's National Health Service. He did also, uh, sorry, Mr. Easy Smiles and Expensive Watchers also suggested The Great Escape, the uh, the old movie. Um, I was surprised. I looked up, according to one poll, 2006, um, it asked people what family film would you most want to see on Christmas Day, and The Great Escape came in third, but was the first among the choices for male viewers. I was genuinely surprised. There's a really good From Taylors With Love podcast episode, um, all about the costumes of the film, um, Maybe this is a controversial opinion, but I, I, this this never really grabbed me. <laughs> I was never too grabbed. Uh, the film is largely uh, fictitious. There was a real breakout, but there are very, very significant differences. And even as a young child, I actually found the genuine history much more interesting. Um, I really recommend uh, the, the TV show The World at War, uh, first of all, just as a fantastic documentary. Uh, it doesn't go deep into this, but I just mention it as a fantastic documentary uh, about the Second World War. And again, this is more the kind of thing I read as a child. It is based on a, on a book by Paul uh, Brickhill, uh, who was an Australian who, who was in the camp, um, and he gave his first-hand account. Uh, but as I say, the screenwriters had very, very considerable uh, liberties with it. Um, of course, increasing uh, American involvement. Uh, the American officers were moved away seven months before the escape, uh, which ended their involvement. But of course, if you increase one group of people's involvement um, in the film, you reduce other people's involvement. And one of the more interesting things, to my mind, is that in real life, uh, the guards helped, uh, or some guards helped. There were anti-Nazi German guards, and there were also German citizens um, who were sympathetic and sent things to the camp. Of course, some of these omissions were made uh, because the survivors 
asked for them. Um, it was known among themselves, it was known fairly widely, but they didn't want it in a film um, in case it jeopardised ongoing operations to help prisoners of war uh, at the time. But Nonetheless, I, there are so many liberties taken with it. I must admit, it's not a personal favourite, and if you're, it's your favourite, that's totally okay. There's plenty of films that, uh, <laughs> you know, films of film, a documentary is a documentary. I just cleave towards the others on this one. A suggestion that I'll very much take from Mr. Easy Smiles and Expensive Watches, and also uh, Janice from the Facebook group, is gardening. Hmm. An English garden. I googled what defines an English garden, and I got the answer from Mr. Google... An informal garden whose plantings, walks, and pools do not form any recognisable pattern and are deliberately lacking in a symmetry. As opposed to, uh, sorry, it's a supposed imitation of natural scenery paths. Uh, they tend to be sinuous rather than straight, and trees and bushes are casually arranged. It's the antithesis of a formal garden. So, yeah, as I've travelled around mainland Europe, mostly the the palace gardens and so on, are, you know, it's a it's a palace maze or it's a it's perfectly symmetrical. It's really about the control of nature. Uh, but British palaces have a very, very different, and great houses have a very, very different concept. And what I really like about that is that it just comes from one person. Um, it comes from Mr. Capability Brown. Um, Capability obviously isn't his real name. That's, that's just what he's known as. His real name's Lancelot. So imagine having Lancelot Brown, and everyone thinks, no, no, there's a way better name for you than Lancelot capability um, but he was, he was called that because he would look at these great estates and say this place has capabilities uh, he had a really unique way of talking about it and lots of the people who came across him would kind of write in their diaries and letters and things that have been published since talk about his extraordinary way of talking about it but he had a unique concept um, he designed over 170 kind of parks and great gardens and, and so on um, yeah so a huge amount of what we think of as just an English garden just comes from one man Born in uh, 1715 or possibly 1716, we're not sure, um, and then died in 1783. Phenomenally influential single man who gives us a fairly commonly known concept of the English garden. I'm going to draw to a close here. Although, I must say, Easy Smiles and Expensive Watches also suggested George, uh, George VI. But I think I've just run out of time, and I, and I think <laughs> he did add maybe the mad would be interesting as well. Um, I, I was going to say I think George the Fourth is a really interesting one because uh, George the Fourth, um, gambling and, and dissolute as he was, would also look at cartoons about himself, which would show him as kind of fat and picking out you know food from his teeth and so on, and find it hilarious. So the fact that in England you, know, you can draw all kinds of cartoons and so on, mocking the great and the good, um, actually comes from his era, the Regency era. Um, so it is extraordinary. Actually, going through all the Georges might be a future project. I had wondered before whether I should go through all the English monarchs, but uh, some are more interesting than others, and this is not a history podcast, but, uh, but the six Georges, they're an interesting bunch, and a very varied bunch. So this is one on which I need to meditate, but all my meditations are very much informed by all the messages. So again, G is for great. I had so many people message me that I cannot refuse it. Um, so again, keep messaging me. If you few message me and you have a request for a topic, um, just let me know. Just let me know. G is for great. I hope you enjoyed it. Goodbye.